Welcome to A Life More Wild. I'm Christopher Wilson-Elms from Canopy and Stars, and this is our podcast taking you into the great outdoors, helping you connect with nature. Later on, we'll be chatting to TV presenter and farmer Kate Humble about the value of escaping to the country. But first, we're leaping into some very cold water with Sean Lewis. <laughs> you never ever regret having a swim, even if it's cold when you get in, which is not much fun. You just feel so good when you come out. You're literally immersing yourself in nature. Sean is an adventurer, travel writer, and the creator of award-winning blog, The Girl Outdoors. We've come to Bristol to talk wild swimming, micro-adventures, and being a role model for women in the wild. My name is Sean Lewis, and I'm a travel and outdoor writer and blogger and journalist, so I've got a few different hats. But mostly what I write about are beginner-friendly adventures for people who want to get outdoors more and explore the wild world near them. And I'm particularly passionate about hiking and wild swimming and camping and all those kind of adventures that aren't so much extreme sports and more ways that you can get out of a weekend and explore the amazing corners of Britain that we've got national parks and riverbanks and the ocean. We're so lucky in the UK to have amazing spaces to explore. So that's pretty much what I do. <laughs> so today we've come near the River Chew, about 15 minutes south of Bristol, to one of my favourite swimming spots, which is a deep pool in the river where you can jump in and go for a little swim. And I've been coming here a lot, especially over the last year. It's just a really lovely place to come, surrounded by reeds and there's a big field full of cows that we're in right now going for a little walk so we're walking to the swim spot on the riverbank watch the cow pads thing so i've always been really into the outdoors i've really loved camping and swimming in the sea and those are things i've done since i was little so i've always felt really passionate about getting outside and i'm not particularly good at any sports i'm not really interested in kind of being an athlete or anything like that to be honest so I've always really enjoyed just just enjoying the outdoors for what it is and ways that you can appreciate where you are like walking and swimming which really I think are very mindful ways to be outside so I've always really loved things like that and when I became a journalist I just loved the idea of combining writing and the outdoors so that's what I knew I wanted to do so I actually started my blog as a way of just basically writing about the adventures I was going on and it was a bit of a virtuous circle because then I wanted to go on more adventures to write about more adventures so I'd go on more adventures which I really enjoyed and I've just been doing that ever since really and I feel very lucky that I can write about the things I love and as I got a bit older I did a bit more kind of adventure travel writing which is so much fun I've been doing a bit less of that recently but actually doing less international travel has made me realize again how many beautiful places there are in the UK. We're so lucky, you know, we have so many incredible national parks, even for quite a little country, there's a lot of protected land. We've got this incredible coast. You can find real wilderness and you can find spots where you're completely alone in the natural world. And I think we're so lucky to have that. So it's been quite fun to focus again on exploring that. Writing about special places is really important to me but I'm also really interested in making people more aware of the fact that they can go out and do these things too because I think a lot of people are not sure how to take the first step in the outdoors or even are a bit nervous of trying new things like swimming or things like wild camping or going hiking on their own. There's a lot of adventures like that that people are maybe hesitant to try. So I'm always really keen to encourage people to feel confident outdoors to go out and gain the skills they need to get outdoors and traditionally I don't think you see a lot of women out there and quite often even now when you see women there they're in a mixed group or they're with a guy and I think only recently maybe in the last 10 years has it been a real change there where I think you see you now see so many women outdoors climbing hiking doing things with other women solo camping which I think there's also then a safety concern over whether women are safe when they're hiking or they're camping which I do think that predominantly they are really safe and probably just as safe as on a city street and I think women reclaiming kind of some of that outdoor space is really really important and to realise that they really do have the capacity to get out and explore places 
and you know whether or, even if you've never been camping before there's you might love it <laughs> you, you know if you've never been swimming before you might love it and there's so many little adventures that aren't stressful that don't need to be a tough expedition where you're up a mountain that do help you get outside especially if you've got kids or you're less able or you're just not sure if the outdoors is for you there's adventures of all shapes and sizes to suit everybody so I always really like encouraging people to get out and try new things outdoors So we've been rambling around a tiny little woodland to get to the riverbed, kind of slightly avoiding the herd of cows. And now we've come to a huge fallen tree that's got all its roots out that's sitting vertically. And we're gonna try and squeeze round it and get back down into the little valley where the river is. I kind of take umbrage with this idea that adventure has to be this kind of macho, extreme, adventurer world where it's not a real adventure unless you've really suffered and you know you come back from a round the world cycle trip covered in mosquito bites and you've had to like wee on mountainsides. I think that's great if that's what you're into and I think that can be so fun as well but that's not for everyone and I think especially with kind of outdoor advertising that extreme kind of gnarly side is still what some people think adventure is and I actually don't think that at all because most of us aren't like that. Most of us have nine to five jobs and kids and families and social lives and I think you can still fit adventures around that and adventures can be whatever you want to define them as and they can be gentle and they can be enjoyable. They don't have to be these kind of suffer fests unless that's what you like and I think you can fit a lot into a couple of hours into an evening into a Saturday morning and I really love the idea of making big adventures fit into little time where you don't have to take a lot of time off work and you still for me you still get that real lovely buzz of being outside and being adventurous but you can still have your day-to-day -day life and I don't think there's anything less valuable about that as opposed to you know quitting your job and going on a six month expedition at all actually I think the nice balance in life is to have a balance of adventure and you know the daily grind essentially so I love that I think swimming is fantastic for that because you can fit a wild swim into it. I've, I've done you know a cycle to a river swim and I'm back in an hour and a half and I my day is completely different I think sunrise and sunset are actually really wonderful too if you pick a sunny day you could do an hour's hike um, or even a bivy or a camp at sunset and that's really special and it can really transform how you feel and you can still be at work the next morning or just pop home again for tea. There's still time for stuff like that. Depending on where you live, you might have, you know, if you live on the edge of a national park, you can quite often do a day's hike. And I find even in busy areas of the UK, if you go off for a two or three hour walk, you'll quite often find that you leave the crowds behind and you're on your own and you get beautiful views and big open spaces to yourself. And I think even if that's a day and you go home and sleep in your own bed, that's still for me really makes me feel much, much better and just gives me some headspace. But I'm one of those people where if I'm feeling stressed, if I just go and sit in my garden for 10 minutes, it helps. I think going out for any amount of time is helpful. So now we're at the river by my swim spot, which is one of my favorites. It's so quick and easy from my house and it's just beautiful. It's a deep pool that's lined by reeds and there's a little bridge that goes over it and you can kind of wade out and then you can swim in the deeper water. There's a little tiny weir running along it, so there's a shallow bit, so there's often people with little children who come and paddle on hot sunny days, which is, it's just a lovely place to be really. There's a little bit of the weir that you can sit in and it's almost like a little jacuzzi, a very cold jacuzzi. <laughs> but they always say that cold water is really good for you and the water here is always very cold because it's flowing water from the River Chew. Uh, so I just tell myself that it's, it's physically good for me if I'm struggling. <laughs> Woo! Ooh, that's nice. You get dragonflies here as well. Ooh. <laughs> 
trying to think why I really, really love Wild Swimming, why it's so special. And I think it's because you have to be so in the moment when you're in the water. You're literally immersing yourself in nature and there's nothing to do but swim and be in this cold water. And we know that cold water is physically and mentally really, really good for you. And I think it just forces me to feel calm. If you're feeling anxious or stressed, it will automatically just strip those away and you will feel peaceful and you never ever regret having a swim even if it's cold when you get in which is not much fun you just feel so good when you come out you feel really tingly and calm and it just changes your day and it makes me really really focus on the world around the flowers and the reeds and the, even the nettles that are lining this little river bank I look at them properly and I'm really really present and it reminds me a bit of yoga actually where you stop worrying about what you're doing before and after your swim and you just enjoy your swim. It really resets me mentally. And I think the only other things that make me feel like that maybe are running and hiking where you have to be present and appreciate where you are. And I remember that every single time I go for a swim. The one thing I'd say is be careful how much outdoor adventure you do because you will become absolutely obsessed with it and it'll be all you want to do. And if I do one swim on a Monday, I think, oh, maybe that's me done for the week. But no, it just makes me want to swim on the Tuesday and the Wednesday and suddenly I'm just obsessed with it. But then I think that's so good for you. And I think we're not here on Earth for a long time and filling day-to-day -day life with little adventures is a way to really, really enjoy your time and feel like you're, you're out and being alive, really. <laughs> John Lewis in some fairly bracing water. Now, we all need a little time off now and again, a break from that digital treadmill of notifications and communication, and the right place can help you find that calming mindset. For TV presenter Kate Humble, it was a cabin in the woods of the Dordogne that became her personal refuge. Just, uh, just to set us up, paint the picture of Poacher's Cabin. Where is it? What does it look like? Oh, Poacher's Cabin is my total retreat. There's a bit of a story behind it, but essentially when we first saw it, we had to travel down a gravel track that begins in this, um, what the French call a lieu dit. And a lieu dit is, is a sort of hamlet, really. It's, um, it's essentially, it's a farm with a few houses around it. And this track runs from the road and initially it runs through fields of limousine cattle. So Poacher's Cabin is in the limousine region of France. It's actually, it's in the Limousin National Park, um, but it's right on the border with the Dordogne, but it's not the Dordogne that people think of. It's the bit of the Dordogne everyone drives through to get to the bit of the Dordogne they want to go to, um, which I'm very happy for them to do. Uh, because it's lovely. It feels quite, it feels like a little secret bit of France. So anyway, back to my track. You go down the track and uh, there are fields on either side with these limousine cattle. And limousine cattle are, they're copper coloured. They're very beautiful. They're rather muscular and kind of, you know, Gallic looking. And um, so there's fields of limousine cattle that belong to Joël, the farmer who lives at the top. And the, the, uh, at this rough track descends uh, gently at first and uh, then it becomes wood. It becomes mainly, it's a mainly conifer with a, some broadleaf woodland and it's very dark and dense and uh, it's a little bit like a kind of fairy tale, a Hansel and Gretel wood. Uh, and, and the track keeps going down and down and down and down through the trees and then it just stops. And when we first drove down it, and uh, or bumped down it it's quite bumpy we got out of our our camper van and walked down the slope to what was like a magic clearing in the woods you've been through this kind of quite dense tree cover and suddenly it just opens up and there's a lake and it's got trees all around it. So the trees are reflected in this very dark sort of, you know, that tanniny water that looks a bit like Coca-Cola. 
it's that sort of colour. And the trees are, and the sky are all reflected in the water. And, and kind of just off to one side was this funny little kind of stone pebble dashed shack with a roof that was all covered in moss and it looked like a building that had sort of emerged from the the kind of undergrowth like it had been covered up uh in the way of sleep a sleeping beauty building or something like it's grown there (laughs) exactly exactly it was just this magical setting this kind of this this fairy tail glade at the end of a lane in the middle of the wood with this just beautiful lake and I remember standing there with Ludo, my husband, and we just stood and we just listened. And it was so quiet. And then occasionally you would hear the peep of a swallow or it would be a woodpecker just tapping on the trees. Or you'd then hear, you know, a frog starting to sing. And then the best sound of all, just as we were standing there, we heard this really sharp, and that's a kingfisher. And you hardly ever see them, you hear them, (laughs) but you suddenly get this flash of absolutely brilliant blue (laughs) going straight through the trees. And we were just like, this is magical. How did you find it then? So it was back in 2009 or 2010, quite a long time ago anyway. And I was doing this series, uh, filming this series, and um, and it was wonderful, but it, it did involve just travelling all the time. And I said, oh, I said, I said, all I want is a shack, swim in the river, eat tomatoes and read books for a week. I don't want to see anybody. I don't want to talk to anybody. That's all I want. And amazingly, I found a shack on a lake in the middle of France. And it turned out by glorious chance that the people who owned it, a a lovely English couple called Bob and Di, who've lived in that region of France for a long time, um, had had a cancellation for the very week that we wanted to go. So it was like, it was like this was predestined and it couldn't have been more perfect. And I did eat tomatoes and read books and swim in the lake and saw very few people apart from a couple of ancient French men with proper caps and sticks going and picking mushrooms. There's, it's, it's very good sep country. Ah. So, and it was sep season when we were there. So they were out picking mushrooms. And we did go to the local market in, um, the small town or big village, which is called Piegu Pluvier. And it's had a market and I'm not exaggerating. I think since, since 1648, like every Wednesday. Um, and it's the most incredible, incredible market. So that's basically what we did for the week. And it was heaven. Took our dogs, you know, took the camper van and yeah, just hung out. And at the end of the week, Bob and I came to to say, you know, has everything been okay? Have you enjoyed it? And we were sort of swooning at this point. It was like a it was like a holiday romance. And we just said, we said it's the and it was totally genuine. We said, this is literally the best holiday we have ever, ever had. And Bob looked at me and he he'd see me on the telly, turned out. And he and and he said, But you've been everywhere. And I said, Well, I haven't been everywhere. There's still quite a lot of places on my list. But I said, honestly, this place is really, really special. And what you've done to this cabin to make it it's off grid, but it's totally self sufficient and so comfortable and lovely. I said, it's just magical. We, I said, we've been having cab, cabin fantasies ever since we walked in. And they, and they went, have you? And we went, well, you know, like in that kind of holiday romancy sort of way, like you think limoncello is going to be really good when you get home and it never is, you know, it's that sort of thing. Yeah. And, um, and they said, well, thing is, we, we know of a lake for sale with a cabin on it. Do you want to go and see it? And and this was like seven o'clock at night. We were leaving at five o'clock the next morning. We hadn't packed. You know, we were trying to eke out. You know how you try and eke out a holiday for as long as you possibly can. And um, and we were just like, oh hell yeah, we of course we want to go and see it. So 
We followed Bob and I down the track that I described right at the start between the Limousine cattle and into the woods. And then we found this lake with this funny, ugly little hut covered in moss. And we all stood there and Ludo and I looked at each other and just went, I mean, most people buy a postcard and maybe a fridge magnet. And we're going to buy a lake. We are, we're going to do, of course, I mean, why wouldn't we? (laughs) <laughs> Why wouldn't we do this? And we were th- we're literally mentally going through the things we could sell <laughs> to be able to do it. And this little cabin, I mean, it was, it was basically, I think it was used by either local fishermen or the local hunt. Um, and so we went inside and it had this big table and a big fireplace. And I mean, not quite the, the remains of a sort of Henry VIII type feast with sort of, you know, leg bones of some kind of animal scattered on the floor. But it had that kind of vibe, if you know what I mean. And we just said, you know, could, could, could this be, could, 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 I mean, could this ever be somewhere that you could stay and, and, and it could work like the cabin we've just stayed in? And Bob went, well, yeah, probably. We said, well, would, would you do it? And he went, okay. And, um, and we bought a lake. Amazing. We bought a lake. And then Bob started his kind of magic. We talked about um, how you make something so small work and we did things like I said to Bob, if we put a um, a kind of what I call a stoop. I spent quite a lot of time in Africa, and um, uh, and I have this love for old tin houses with the with the kind of ver- covered verandas at the front. So I said, if we put a, a, a which are always they're called stoops out there. So I said, if we put a kind of covered veranda at the front, that's like an extra room. And I said something that I know. It's a middle-aged thing. You rarely get through the night without needing a pee, particularly because you're in France and you're drinking a lot of rosé because it's so good. Um, And you don't necessarily want to trek across the fields to another building to do that. So I said, somehow we need to integrate uh, some sort of bathroom arrangement that is part of the cabin. I had nothing, nothing and nothing at all. And it, I mean, there's no septic tank. There's no, uh, there's no plumbing of any description. There's no electricity. So talking to Bob, we were like, well, how, how can we make it practical without taking away from that essence of wildness? So it has a composting loo, but it's, we built, Bob built a kind of platform, uh, off the back so we could have space for a little composting loo, which, he made so beautiful. It's like the poshest composting that you've <laughs> ever seen. And uh, and a shower with a solar pump that pumps the water from the lake into the shower. Bob built it over about a two-year period. And what was so lovely was that every part of it, you know, every bit of wood, he can say, well, that was a tree that I cut down in this wood or that was a tree that fell down in the woods around Woodman's cabin, his one of his cabins. So it's a really, I think it's testament to Bob's extraordinary talent. It's a piece of art. So over the years, it's just become, as I say, the the place that I retreat to. And it's it's like, it's not a very nice analogy, but, you know, it's, it's like when something completely runs out of batteries and has to be plugged in again that is my plugging in it's my recharge your your charge point yeah (laughs) i like it i love going to poachers and reading the visitor's book and i've read things in the visitor's book that have made me cry where you know people have come and they've just they've clearly they've come usually from a city and they're exhausted and we have an old telescope that belonged to Ludo's dad. We've got that at Poachers. You can't really see anything. You know, we're in the trees, but we've got it there. And um, and people turn up and I think they have, usually they have plans or we're going to go and see all these things that are in the area or whatever. And most people say, we just didn't want to leave. We didn't want to leave. We've just sat in a hammock or we've swum in the lake. You know, everyone bangs on about wild swimming. I've been doing it. You know, if you've got a lake, you swim in it and it's beautiful. But I think for people to have that level of seclusion and peace and somebody wrote 
they'd set up the telescope and it was clearly full moon when they were there and they just looked at the moon through the telescope and it's going to make me cry just talking about it and I just I've never I've never seen the moon like that I've never seen stars like that I've never heard frog singing and she didn't want to go anywhere else she said we just didn't leave we just stayed here and and I think there's something lovely about about that that very quickly people seem to tap into something that I think as human beings we all need that earthy contact we need to be able to walk barefoot on grass we need to be able to submerge our bodies unencumbered by any sort of clothing in dark cool water and watch the swallows come down and feed at the same time we need to hear the the wind in the leaves or the you know the, the woodpecker pecking those are the things that feed our souls and and poachers for me and for a lot of people who've stayed there that's what it does for them there's no internet there's no phone signal there's just nature Thanks for joining us for A Life More Wild. I hope Sean and Kate have got you craving cold water and cabin life. If you want to learn more about what either of them are up to, check the links in the episode notes. You'll also be able to find out where to buy our book, in which Sean features alongside some other great writers. Remember to follow us on social media and in your podcast app as well to hear the rest of the episodes. Until next time, stay wild.